Yeah, a lady. Sorry, you want to say something? Uh, just an observation that I'm having. I think this is all really good discussion. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm anticipating it'd be nice to maybe have some other type of educational follow-up meeting. Yeah. Where I mean, you guys have a forum to ask kind of specific questions on on how we administer the FPA, what the language means. Um, yeah, I'd be willing to, well, to, you know, to do that. And they're looking for they're to looking to for somebody to lead discussions about yeah. Forest Three at the No Tie School Building, to Middle School. I see. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and 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 or yeah. or all of the above. You know, this business of how it happens. There's a fair amount of mystery because by the time we get to written plans and <laughs> and uh, stays of operation, all this other mumbo jumbo has happened months <laughs> before. You know, yeah. and. If you're not so facile with that, then some of this may not yeah, be so fun. Yeah, but for our time period today, we, yeah, we, we, need, to get on to, track. Sure. we need to get Ashley input yeah. for the work she's doing and, and Joe because we're on time frames. Mm -hmm. But from the info I'm hearing, it's like I can see some type of educational forum discussion just to help interpret and understand that. Excellent. And, uh, going on. I think a lot of our questions have come out of knowledge actually you know I have more to say but now's not the time to say and I'm sure other people have more to say about misclassifications of streams and how that could be um, how we have to work together with landowners to reclassify streams and have old classifications that are incorrect mm -hmm. and that's really where my question is going. Yeah. Method of stream classification we can we can have a whole other discussion. Thank you. Okay, sorry, actually. No, okay. Yeah, that's no, that's right. This, this is, is really this is good. good. Yeah. So, but for now, those type F, those streams that are designated as type F, um, type D, uh, those are the ones that we're focusing on. So, uh, a couple more definitions uh, that we can just go over before we get into the actual house bill itself. Um, one is the general vegetation retention prescription, which we kind of talked about. Um, this definition is is not in the Forest Practices Act. This is my um, what do you call that? My waiver of my own definition written here, and Peter can <laughs> tell me if it's wrong, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I, and I should write down there, it's in rule, but what these are, they're harvest operations that are canned in rule that, like Peter said, they tell you how um, to operate in certain conditions based on um, the stream type and the particular region, and they are, uh, they tell you the types of vegetation that should be retained in order to um, promote the desired future condition of mature stream side stands. So um, if you want to look further into those, they are in rule, and I can give you that rule if you want to write it down. It's um, under this division 640 and 629, 640. And that will tell you all those different vegetation retention prescriptions. So um, RMA, most you probably know, but it's just that area alongside of the water um, that has uh, different, uh, certain uh, vegetation retention needs to be kept. So, um, and that's when that general vegetation retention prescription comes into play, is that you can actually enter that RMA area and perform a prescription to actively manage it. Um, then stewardship agreements, I'm sure Paul can talk a lot about that, but that is the other um, component of the House Bill where we've been given the authority, and actually that already was in statute to waive um, the requirement for a plan if the, um, I don't know if the great term is landowner, or Runner has entered into a stewardship agreement. So, um, but that's a voluntary written plan um, where they work um, with the landowners work with ODF to kind of create an uh, overall land management plan. Like this is a written yeah. plan that's submitted separate from any other. Yeah, and, and, and they actually, it's almost like a larger written plan where they have to do a single you know, Stewardship agreement is like a it's like a it's like a written plan for the next 10 years, imagine if you will. Right. And, well, it's, and it's about, it's rather than describing protection standards on an operation by operation basis, it describes protection standards on an, on an ownership basis as a whole. Like David Eisler has his David Eisler is a, is a, 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 a stewardship agreement. Yes. So there's two things that are, a stewardship agreement assumes a, as a prerequisite a management plan. The Forest Practice Act does not require a management plan. Uh, we've been working for over 40 years with family forest landowners to encourage the development of management plans uh, <coughs> under the uh, U.S. Forest Service Forest Stewardship Program because we believe when people sit down and work up a management plan, you get better outcomes on the ground. The stewardship agreement is more of a, a wraparound instrument on that management plan that just says 
if you exceed the Forest Practice Act in this way, here's sort of the regulatory certainty we'll give you, and here's the um, you know efficiency we'll give you. You don't have to submit individual plans because you've demonstrated that you know what you're doing and you're going to follow these procedures. Uh, we also have you we use that with our safe harbor agreement for spotted owls that you're mentioning. Um, we many landowners want to grow older trees and then if they create habitat for spotted owls and they get penalized under our current Endangered Species Act. The Safe Harbor Agreement's an approach under the Endangered Species Act where it says, hey, if you do great management and attract a spotted owl, you can do, continue to do management. But we use the Stewardship Agreement, and that's the one. I think, was David the first? Uh, uh, yeah, and that probably, uh, Lena, you might put that up there for the next uh, the next pot of coffee is Stewardship Agreements. You know, maybe they will be into that for another time. Anyway, I just wanted to highlight those, those for this is that the offer, it's changed from 300 feet to 100 feet to mirror the RMA. So the RMA for significant loans is 100 feet mostly. That means that's the largest RMA. So prior, we were we were crying about 300 feet. And so there was 200 feet there that wasn't even an RMA that we were having to receive these written plans that were saying, I'm not even going to be working in the RMA. So here's, here's 200 feet there. So um, that changes that requirement there. But other, other than that, these are mirroring each other. You can come back to that one. Okay. So um, some of you might recognize, recognize this artwork um, from our uh, Paul Clemens. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, this was just wanted to throw in a visual so we can get those um, distances kind of uh, visualized. So we have um, our stream with our riparian area and then the different uh, levels that they go out. So um, 10 foot is a no touch zone at all. 20 foot is the no cut zone at all. And then 50 foot is the, um, and I have on the next slide, but that's an RMA distance for small stream, small type F and D. And then 60 foot, I'm, I assume it's aerial spray. Um, no direct application. No direct application. With an aerial spray at 60, at 60 feet. And then 70 feet is for the type F, um, Medium, thank you. And then uh, the 100 is our type, um, type F. So large, large uh, type F. So there we go. There's, there's um, a table of it. So those large type Fs will not be affected by this rule change um, because it's at the RMA is at the 100 feet. And we're talking about what's going on within the 100 feet. So if they want to operate within the RMA, or if they want to operate within 100 feet um, for that large type F, they are operating within the RMA. So they would have to require, we would require written plan. Um, the streams that could be affected by this, um, I don't like how I'm saying that, not affected, but the operations that can be changed by, by that, that is the large type Ds, um, all type Ds, and then the medium and small type Fs. Does everybody know what we say type D domestic? Right. So uh, again, here's a, just an example of an operation that could be affected by the rule. Um, it's an operation on a medium type F stream with a 70 foot RMA. So current, so it's a fish stream with a uh, medium 70 foot RMA. Um, the written plan is now required at 100 feet, regardless of whatever the RMA distance is. Um, so the uh, operator would have to submit a written plan and um, 15 days would be required with 15 days before they could work um, or excuse me that's 14 days <laughs> so, um, so that should, I should say 14 so 15. Um, but they're required with 14 days for that written plan or written plan comment period to end um, so they could work in that remaining 30 feet so I know that's a lot of numbers I don't know if I'm being clear but does that are we on, on the same page about that? Yes, the yeah. current language. That's current language as it is now. That, that's the kind of the industry. Okay, so, the plan's required 150 days waiting for you to work in the moon, 30 feet outside the moon. And I'm sorry, that's, I should say 14. 
So the idea there is that if you're having an operation near a uh, medium fish stream, but your your harvest unit is uh, 95 feet away, or you know between 70 and 100 feet away from the small fish stream, we know that there's going to be no direct impact to the fish stream because they're or the riparian area because they're not entering the riparian area. Right now, they would have to submit a written plan, and they do, and what they say is, I'm not going to enter the riparian area, um, and it gets to that unnecessary boilerplate written plan. If we review them, we can't just rubber stamp them, because it gets really embarrassing when they've listed the wrong stream, and that happens more than you would know when they do the cut and paste, and do a cut and paste, and they try to do a global <laughs> Replace. So we actually have to review them and make sure. And so that would be an example where the feedback we've gotten from the Regional Forest Practices Committee is they're pretty comfortable with it, saying, yeah, that's a non value added written plan. If you're not going to operate within the riparian area, why are you doing a written plan associated with the riparian area? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Can I? You try to do that with a type D because many of the phone calls Beyond Toxics receives is from concerned landowners who have a domestic water source. Uh, either some many times it's on another property. You know, they have water rights that go over to the yeah, property line. And uh, forestry operation is occurring very close to the <coughs> water source. So uh, am I understanding this correctly that, um, and I don't know what a large type D, a medium well, type D, and a small uh, type D would be. Uh, or another, th uh, probably a more common thing is that an operation is occurring and they don't know if it's near the water source or not. You, they, they uh, the, the uh, downstream water, the downstream, the person who's calling you, yeah. I, you know, somebody told me they're going to log it there and I got a spring and I don't want it messed with. Right. And I'm worried. Okay, and so how is that information managed? And and so uh, ideally, if somebody's getting in that RMA, there's a written plan. You know, that's the norm we have now for those for those guys who are going to manage that land. Uh, they may say, no, we're not even going over there. You know, and then and then they want to they want to manage efficiently by not having to spend time and energy. And two weeks on something that's not subject to what they're going to do. Okay, so but maybe it goes in the pipe rack there, but as someone drinking water, sure. right. like human people yeah. drinking water, I, which is just as important as a fish, right. you know, I'm not sure I understand why um, the RMAs are different for type D, and is that a change from the way it used to be? No. Um, there's no change in protection standards. Okay, well, there's no so, change in the distance. Yeah. Right. And so there's no, not from since 1994, which was the last change. And prior to 1994, there were class one yeah, and class two. 1994 was the inception of our current stream classification system. system. And um, the, the, the fish weren't fish. It was sizable fish. So the only... It was fish of a certain size. Yeah, yeah it was, it had, it was fish of a certain size. And, 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 then, and, that, and, that and that classification still exists. Uh, and I, uh, you might check with Lane County's Planning Commission and what, what, what uh, metric they use for, but that's not for us. We're, we're well, except there is a, the point I want to make is that domestics were class one as well. So, uh, fish and domestics um, were in one class, class one streams, and then class two, and class one streams had protection. When we did the shift over to this classification system, the one uh, agreed upon thing would be there'd be no net decrease in protection of domestic water supply, which is what led to this um, specified but D classification. So it's an odd sort of thing because we have large, medium, small 
fish and non-fish, and then another layer which is domestic, which essentially adds more protection to non-fish streams that have, uh, and they're equal to the previous protection that they received under the old system. So there and was, it, a, was and it's probably essential for you for you to really grasp in order to respond to the people that are calling you that this classification applies only to those domestic water uses that are registered with the state water master. And there are, there, are, there are many, many, many people who are using surface water uh, without registration with the State Water Resources Board. And that, and that registration is an essential, it's a, it's a prerequisite to that classification. And, and that's often an issue for people who have a water supply and have not registered it. You know, they may have bought the property and they may not know whether or not they're... Yeah. And that's I, fundamental I understand that. that it's in fundamental. Many, many examples, but yeah. I do want to come back to this at some time. Yeah. I'm not yet convinced that this is protected, and I don't understand how a small stream with tiny fish gets 50 feet and the family with the tiny baby drinking out of the tiny well, okay. uh, they, spring is yeah. only 20 and, that, and, that's, and that discussion is probably outside the scope of what we're right, here to do. And I we should probably get to that some other, when we have yeah. our other pot of coffee, yeah. we can talk about that. Okay, but, thank you. But uh, that, that, you know. We can, so a stream or a main classifier. for yeah, the point well, is, this is just standard. She's got that up there. Yeah, right there, cool. yeah. And, and you might, under that, you might put, uh, you, the, you the know, classification. Protection what, protection. Yeah, put protection yeah. standards, you know, per, you know, uh, relative protection standards. Or, right, right. Is that, is that, oh, sure, sure. And we get it all the time from folks who have a, you know, there's an old kid's swimming pool up in the creek that's going to pipe to my house, you know, and, and it's, we like that. And, uh, I'm talking those about valid right, right. filed yeah. with the state water sure. master right. and there's been clashes sure oh. the and Historic. we get the call mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> okay well I'm gonna keep moving because we're gonna Thank we're you. gonna but um, basically if statute language is implemented the rule change could allow that operator then to work within that 30 feet and that's no no um, this is what goes back to this is purely administrative change as far as paperwork goes, and that there's no standards on the ground um, that are changing within that 30 feet. They still have the same rules that are applying, but they're not entering that RMA. There's no uh, specific management required um, recommendations or anything like that. So, All right, so the operator says, I'm not going to the RMA. The forester says, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> well, if I go to the RMA, well, here's the thing that enter an RMA and do activity and you don't have a written plan, under the way you know the written plan you would be in violation of operating in a riparian area without a written plan. So, you know, the the um, there's no uh, incentive to do that. There's a big disincentive. Um, so and then yeah, so and so this came and so, from our folks, not from uh, the industrial uh, they were not against it, and uh, family forest landowners, uh, we went to the committee for family forest, they weren't against it, but the idea originated from stewardship foresters, not vice versa. Thank you. All right, I'm going to skip past this, but this is what we talked about at the time, the percentage of written plans, but um, as far as the RMA's um, written plans that we're talking about now, there's about 40% reduction of those written plans. So uh, throughout our outreach that we've had so far, internal and uh, with um, our some external outreach, um, there's some operations that we just have decided that are out of scope, um, that don't fit into it, that basically um, are still, uh, there's still value in those written plans. Um, so uh, aerial and pressurized ground spray operations, road construction within RMA, um, and cable yarding through an RMA. However, with cable yarding through RMAs, we understand um, that, that um, those written plans are a bulk of the cookie cutter written plans that are received. And so uh, as we go out to do our phase two outreach, we'd like to try to work to see if there's a certain subset of those that we could, um, that, that information could be captured through the notification. 
Um, but as of now, it's um, those those types are uh, written plans that will still be required. To, uh, uh, still be required. Right, we're talking about dragging lines through a screen. No, no. no. We don't have a good no. We're talking no. overhead. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, sometimes they're overhead, sometimes they don't have full lift in their corridors through. So there's a variety of the details there. And, you know, that's what we're trying to see. If, it, if they're clearly flying over and there would be no impact, the concern is that they still got to get the cable through there and lift the cable up. And so is there going to be impact there or is there any value added by talking about how they're going to string the cable? I mean, yeah. you, there's only one way to string the cable. Unless you're using a helicopter. Well, yeah. yeah. well, well, yeah. well, well yeah. 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 human. But, human or helicopter? But, but there, 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 are, there are standards of practice for running cable lines through RMAs that occur as boilerplate language, you know, and and those things are, you see them, and they cut and paste that stuff too, you know, yeah, and, and so, and so I, right. we'd know, like to, but right now, you see that it says it's outside the scope. Right. The reason road construction within an RMA is never thrown out of scope is that particularly the, most of those have to do with culvert placement. Um, you know, they're not allowed to locate roads in riparian areas. They're allowed to go through them. We have pretty good evidence that there's a lot of value added that if they have a written plan uh, designed for a culvert, there's a much greater chance that, that culvert is put in correctly than if they don't have a written plan. And early on, when we started setting those standards for the written plans on that, we saw a real improvement of culvert uh, placement in those streams. So that was just, you know, sort of the thought process for what we said was out of scope. So the one that I know that you might have been concerned about is aerial uh, and pressurized ground spray and the written plans on those. And we just didn't think those. Uh, we think that, well, I don't know, would you see those adding value? Yes. To remain in the written plan yeah. as required. Yeah. Well, if you if you look at your if you look look at your uh, diagram here, the, the little cartoon of uh, uh, distances, um, you got 10, 20, 50, 60, 70, for example, and under the under the current rules, that 60 foot distance is the is the nearest that an aerial spray application could occur to a type F stream or a type D stream. So that's outside of 50 feet, which is the RMA width for that kind of stream. And how, at what height is this delivered? At 60 feet, at what height is that delivered? Height is not a part of the rules. It, it's, it's slope distance on the, the ground. ground. And the height is... Oh, you're miss you, the, the height of the helicopter. I understand what she's oh. asking, but there's nowhere in our rules that say anything about the height of the helicopter. Mm -hmm. That's in the label. That's in the label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our rules say apply to the label. The label right. talks about that. But 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 it the the reason I'm pointing this out is that the 60 foot distance is there for a reason, and the 50 foot distance is less than that. And so uh, the 100 foot distance is the written plan distance you see in that picture. Mm -hmm. And this proposal you see here would not diminish the distance between 60 and 100. It was you would still need a written plan for those aerial applications within 100 feet. And that's because of the new laws? And well, it's because that we think the value is there to have those written plans, and the value is demonstrated by your willingness to be here today. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and so what would be the value of telling you that this isn't important to you? Because it is. And so, and so there you have it, you know? Point being is, you could be within 100 feet and say, I'm going to not spray in the RMA of a type F medium stream at 70 feet and, and then uh, dismiss the need for that 60 foot distance. And we could say, well, you don't need a written plan. But really what we're saying is, yeah, given the level of interest that this is just one we're going to, we're not going to, you know, put the, what is it, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, as you say. You know? and, uh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, okay. So now we're kind of getting leading out to like the discussion part of this, and I'm going to share with um, what uh, what other outreaches um, had. We've met with our internal um, uh, geographic areas uh, within within the agency. Um, we got to meet with the Northwest and the Southwest Regional Forest Practice Committees um, and representatives from the Eastern Oregon area. Uh, we met with DEQ and Committee for Family Forest Land, SFI, which I did want to comment on because we had talked about the certification of written plans and that um, uh, SFI said that with the removal of some of these written plans that that isn't going to hurt the certification process because they don't certify on written plans, they certify on whether resources were damaged or not. So they go out and look at if there's resource damage. So just to close the loop on that. Okay. Um, so a little bit of our concept discussions from around the state is that, that um, these changes, and this is, this is comments, like I said, from, from our so written plans in general, um, they allow for education and communication from OEF and for operator land management communication. Um, a lot of the community uh, family forest lands, um, they spoke to the fact that they use that written plan to communicate with their operators. Um, their operators. So um, part of the education might be trying to figure out if there's another tool to assist them uh, if they do move forward and, and have a, a portion of these written plans not required any longer. Written plans can have access to social license log. Um, and written plan no longer required does not change the adherence to FPA rules. And that's an important one. Just because the written plan is not required, um, this is once again just an administrative change and it's not um, changing what FPA is actually saying you can do. So um, I just like to hear that. When, when someone actually said that to me one time, I was like, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it just makes it clear. Uh, so the written plan with the goal is to provide a tool. Um, that was taken away in two, or not, excuse me, the authority to approve them um, was removed in 2003, I think. Was that recent? I think it's, yeah. So does that just mean nobody approves well, them now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We don't have an approval, uh, we don't have a permitting system. We have a notification system, there's a real distinction. Uh, and we used to have approval of written plans. and. Um, we got sued, uh, and I believe it was under the Endangered Species Act, for approving a written plan and authorizing the take. And we don't have any control over the Endangered Species Act. I think it was related to that. And at that point, the change was made to remove our authority to approve. The one thing we can approve is alternate plans for practices, things that are outside the scope of the rules. But written plans, we are able to comment on it. So we can say things like, if you follow that written plan, you'll be in violation of the Forest Practice Act, and we will cite you. But, um, the, the, I mean, that doesn't come up very often. You know, it, or, and the, one of the other concerns that came out of this was, you know, uh, we're using it as a vehicle for uh, communication with one time operators, family forest landowners who don't regularly operate. You see, they're not, you know, sort of the, the more active, that do a notification every year, they do one because we need to get some money off their land. We had used that as a communication tool. And, you know, because they had to put one in, we could sit them down and talk to them. And I've pushed back pretty hard. If we, you know, we want to create that communication Let's create that communication through a different mechanism rather than requiring something that's unnecessary across the broad range of people who operate. The small landowners generally not a problem. The work they know, uh, the ones that are. I mean, they may not know what they're doing, but. Yeah, and uh, so the ones that, the, you know, what we are traditional. Family forest landowners that we've been interacting with that we can help them write management plans that we're engaged in getting cost share or farm bills now, equip things. No, they're not not the problem. The the biggest problems are the one time operating operations that um, they don't even, sometimes they don't even know there's a forest practice act. Sometimes we only discover them after they've tried to deliver their logs to the mill and they don't have a notification. 
you know, those are the ones that worry us more than ever, or they don't commit to reforestation. You know. So some specific discussion regarding our plans. Um, no entry into the RMA, um, no rent plan required. Um, this is a different slide. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, slope has come up a lot, um, and we're hoping during the phase two to kind of tease out exactly what that means. Um, that's been something that's been brought up a lot, and we're trying to figure out if it's all types of operations or um, if it's just specific if it's hand, hand falling. Um, so hopefully that will be developed a little bit more. One of the questions we asked, um, why, why are problems occurring in the RMA? And um, cause sometimes, even if you have a written plan, there will still be things that could happen. I mean, the written plan isn't just like, it, it's a piece of paper. It's not actually the cutter off that's doing the cutting. So um, it, either measuring wrong or poor layout, or there was no pre-op inspection, or lack of communication with the cutters, or people just make mistakes. Um, so why problems don't occur? Uh, there's that third-party certification, kind of social standard, uh, they want to keep a clean history. There's been good communication with the cutters and there's been pre-ops with ODS. So one of the things that we really heard um, when we met with uh, the regional forest practice committees was that the uh, industry as well as operators really value those pre-operation inspections with our search foresters that on the, on the ground, um, face-to-face -face communication or over the phone if they have a, you know, a, a more intimate relationship. It's just um, they really value that. So that kind of seems to be like the trigger that when those are happening, that is what's really leading to the reduction of um, any uh, detriment. The, uh, <coughs> the slope criteria? Mm -hmm. In the coast range, um, whether you have a scientific background or not, you live out there, you know, slope is so huge, and if that is not addressed, it, it all goes out the window. I'm glad to see it's there. But I just want you to know that um, if people are, it's a red flag in yeah. that coast range. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and that is one of the things that we have heard. We just need to understand um, if there are rules um, in the FDA that already address slope, mm -hmm. um, that say this is how you have to operate on April uh, like hazard and sun hazards, mm -hmm. or if they're uh, ground harvesting on uh, a 60% slope, uh, or if it's a 40% um, erosion. So there already are rules to tell you how to operate. Whether we need to incorporate that into this rule specifically um, to require a written plan just because of the slope, we need to know if that's actually going to add value. So, um, so we just we're, we're hearing it. We just need to see exactly what it is. But your comment, it, right in line, that if I could say one thing that I've heard is the slope. So, <laughs> so uh, and so, what is the concern about slope that will be associated with? written plans in this case or just what are your concerns about slope so we can actually can carry that to the I, I think the needs. concern is if the slope is being accurately identified that's what we're concerned. yeah we see the we see the results every year there needs, every there needs year. to be a definition of what slope is because most people think angles are slope so 50 percent is straight up and down and 100 percent means I mean, 100% doesn't include high degrees, but people that have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. In general, and I, I've seen it just pretty loosely. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's about. All right. <laughs> One of the things that I one of the one of the places that that's uh, spoken to in the notification process currently is when the uh, person who submits a notification is asked to identify slope of the place where the operation will occur, the question on the form is on the steepest third of the unit. That's that's asked now. Okay. And, and so uh, Gary's, Gary, you know, Gary says, what the heck, you know, people know, what is it, slope, anyway, and how steep's your roof, or what? So, you know, sometimes we have to tell people what slope is, you know, and then, uh, and, you know, any population of people has a wide range of understanding of this kind of concept. But in our notification process now, it does ask on the steepest third of the unit. That's where the, that's, his, that's, the, that's the, uh, the calibrator there. Well, and what do you think, oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was going to ask Joe, um, maybe that's something that can be discussed when we get to IT, because it seems like we're going to a 
GIS-based system, there would be accurate ways to determine the slope instead of guesswork. As accurate as it, I'm the, yeah, as yeah, it, it that occurs today. So even if they have no idea, they come in and they mark it one way, they'll digitize it, and there is a there is a landslide overlay that they look at, and it, it shows where there's a, a medium slope or a, yeah. or a high slope. And, and if there's in the high slope is a red, it's I didn't you can usually see it. Yeah, that's it's pretty easy. And, and one of one of the outcomes of the guiding process that is about efficiency has to do with the manner in which we verify the information that we get on notifications and that's become more systematized right. and 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 so uh, we have different resources than we had in the past and we use them differently to uh, reflect on what people tell us so yeah, and the, and the slope delineation by maps is as good as the maps are. And people think maps are facts and maps are models. And even with the LIDAR, <coughs> that's the new sliced bread for slope identification. Um, and there's, it's still a modeling procedure to convert the LIDAR data in, uh, into slope and there's errors associated. So, sure. They'll catch the, in the notification process up front. We can catch obvious steep slopes, but it still is that pre-op on the ground to get the the smaller head walls and things that wouldn't show up uh, through a GIS layer. Did you want to come back to your question about why does it matter to us? Yeah, I did. I agree. First, year, there's, a, there's a concern about the clear understanding of slope and what it is, and so then other concerns about slow. What I hear is, again, uh, not the person living out there, is the calls we get from the um, sediment in the domestic water sources. We don't, we, don't, we don't issue permits, and we don't deny 
or approved. Uh, so a notification, people notify us of what they're going to do, and we reflect on what they propose uh, in contrast to what the rules require. So we, you, but you have the ability to say this is not possible to do due to... What we have the ability to say if, if you do this, you will not comply with the rules. Uh -huh. Right. So, and and I'll, I'll talk to, because uh, from the maintenance of the system, we'll, come, we'll get comments back from officers that say, hey, this, this chemical is not listed in there. Gotcha. Um, you know, can you go ahead and you add it? Mm -hmm. Well, before we add anything to the system, it goes through Brad Knott's so policy person who reviews and, and determines whether it's applicable to forestry or not. And I'd say 20% of the time we deny or we don't add it to the system because whatever they're trying to use is not applicable to forestry. Okay. And so that communication goes back to whoever submitted the notification saying this is not, this chemical is not applicable to forestry, you cannot use it. So when the, when the farmer says I'm going to use crossbow, yeah. Yeah. that's come. You know, the guy will say, and you know the story, you know, we're going to use crossbow. Well, no. Don't tell me that. You can't. I can use. Go down there and get something that says forestry on the label because it's not. That, that's labeling. That's all about labeling. And we're. Let's go on with notifications. Yeah. So, it, so I've heard three main concerns about steep slope: lack of clear understanding about steep slope, sediment domestic water sites, uh, associated potential contamination, uh, turbidity and temperature, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, or you uh, check on use of label related to slopes. Right. And then what I'm hearing is specific to what Ashley needs to work on the rule language is that aerial and pressurized spray written plan written plans for those operations have value. You want to keep them. You don't want to waive them. And that slope criteria, we need to flush that out a little bit as it applies to the written plan waiver process. Yeah, I think so it's important to define and include, so we need to do some work on that. I think when you're entering the notification, there needs to be a way to find out exactly what that means. Oh. But most people don't understand that 45 degrees is 100% safe. Mm -hmm. right. okay. And Joe might be able to. I'll give okay. Okay. And also, we had questions about domestic water sources and the uh, RMA. Oh, I got you. It's over here. Yep, yeah. stream protection plan and RMA list. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying to keep it separate. So Ashley has something to work with specific to her process. These are the, like, somebody said bike rack. I like that. It's better parking lot. Yeah. So this is like, okay, these are the other things that we need to come back, have another discussion, provide input information. So let me know if I'm getting it right. Okay. Spelling does not count. Great. <laughs> <laughs> <The> charts. <laughs> so a little bit of significant wetlands because it's, it's very similar as far as the, the, the changes are. Um, that, that we're still in favor of that um, time saving to happen and that, that um, they agree with the, the 100 foot. Yeah, I was nearing the RMA distance rather than um, just 300 foot distance that was previously there. So, once again, not going into the RMA, but requiring it to let the, the larger buffer. Um, I have a comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, that was I'm not a hydrologist. Uh, I've been in Lake County Planning Commission for eight years, so I heard a lot of hydrologists talking. And uh, we all know that in the wetlands, what's underground and that we cannot see is still hydrologically connected to what we can see in the wetlands. So I, and that's a particular concern for wetlands, is that their, their wetiness <laughs> extends beyond what we can see. And so I really, don't understand why the particular nature of wetland we decrease RMA from 300 to 100 when the hydrological connections are. It's not decreasing the RMA. Yeah, no, we did decrease the, we decreased the distance for the written plan. Written plan. Written plan. We did not decrease, yeah. we did not change the RMA. There were no changes to the standards of protection in any of the House Bill 2165 process. We did not. You know, the level of protection, everything is the same as it was previously. All we're talking about that we changed was the distance when there's a statutory written plan. And so, let, let maybe speak, if I may, to, again, we're back to the classifications of water as a state. Okay? And as the classification works through in the Forest Practices Act, 
Um, is it a wetland? If yes, is it greater than eight acres? A, a wetland greater than eight acres is considered a specified resource site. And that's noted in statute along with like spotted owls. Okay. Um, uh, a wetland greater than eight acres could include a small fish bearing stream. But in the classification of waters, the wetland, the specified resource site that is a wetland greater than eight acres would trump the protection standards for the small fish bearing stream. Mm -hmm. Beyond the margin of the wetland greater than eight acres, protection for a distance of 100 feet is required. And that's not changing. Pardon? That's not changing. And that's not changing. Uh, that's, that's the riparian management area that provides protection to the wetland area. Uh, so, um, on the ground, if you will, where the skunk cabbage stops and the sword fern starts, go out there 100 feet, and, and that's the edge of the RMA. Historically, for another 200 feet, you had to have a written plan and wait for two weeks before you could work 200 feet from the edge of that, from the skunk cabbage. Um, you know, every thousand feet of 50 feet is an acre of land. Every, uh, so what is that? Every thousand feet of 300 feet is six acres of land. So there's like, you know, every thousand feet, there's four acres of land somebody can't work on for two weeks, even though they're not going to work, for the, even they're not even down there. And that's just an administrative hang up. So I understand that, but what I would say, have you consulted hydrologists? Well, there, that, was that, a reason, when I went, there was a reason somewhere in the past that it was 300 feet. Well, that, and that has to do with the statutory origins of specified resource sites. As a, and remember when I talk about how we built our house one room at a time, okay, and, and we had these stream protection rules and we worked on them, and then we had these specified resource sites and we worked on them. 300 feet is specified resource site. That's like getting over near a nest tree for an owl, for example. And, and so the, the origins of the, of the, of the uh, contrast you observe have to do with the uh, genesis legislatively of how those protection standards were applied. One is for specified resource sites and the other is for waters of the state. But well, wasn't there science to back up why that 300 feet was needed? Uh, I mean, the, no the, more the science. The science, no, back, the the science, science backs up the hundred foot width of the RMA. Right. So where the where we do have uh, historically hydrologists, we've always had hydrologists on the uh, staff. Jim Palmer, Gallon is Martin Van Allen is a hydrologist, uh, forest hydrologist. Uh, my predecessor Jim Paul was a forest hydrologist. Uh, we're hiring now a water quality specialists. We're in the process of doing that. Hydrology would be one of the disciplines that we would are uh, considering acceptable for that position. So we understand the importance of water and water of the state. And so, again, the distances that the legislature set for requiring written plans and statute were much more of a political process rather than a scientific process. And wetlands, is what Paul was saying, wetlands were brought in under specified resource sites and they set a limit of 300 on those. Um, riparian areas were brought in as riparian areas. Why one riparian area was brought in under specified resource sites is just sort of the anomaly of how protection evolved over time. So, so, so to, to try to hear what you're saying differently is the question about the adequacy of a 100-foot RMA for a wetland greater than eight acres, or is a question about the uh, the adequacy of the written plan process for a 100-foot RMA for a wetland greater than eight acres? I think the question is, um, if a wetland can have impacts that we can't see or are seasonal, because wetlands mm -hmm. often shrink and expand. Maybe that's why originally it was 300 okay. well, feet, so because you might be... So then, the, let me ask the question then. Is the question then about the determination of the, of the uh, dimensions of the resource that we're protecting? I think my question is, because we're talking about written plans, is 
that if um, ribbon clamps had been required for 300 feet, that seemed like a precautionary thing to do because of wetlands, their nature, and their the, the, the written plan describes what happens within 100 feet. That's the new chain. No. 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 So the, the, old, the whole standard has always been that if you're within, and it has really what it has to do with is what happened in that legislative session when they said a wetland greater than eight acres requires an RMA of 100 feet from the upper extent of the wetland condition, and those are, and wetlands are described in rule, and uh, on the ground they're delineated. Uh, a hundred foot protected area, riparian management area for the wetland. So they were only operating outside of that. They would say, I'm operating outside of the wetland RMA and will follow the Forest Practice Act. I have no impact on the riparian protection and that would be the source of the written plan. The written plan doesn't add additional protection. It adds when you have to, to write it. And you know, essentially a written plan is to trigger in some ways, if you're going to operate in the riparian area, you better show us you know what the restrictions on that operate in that riparian area are. So the kind of the real purpose of the written plan is to serve notification, you're in a right, you know, you're near a stream, you better watch out. And so the legislature just said, well the biggest order made is a hundred foot, so any if you're within a hundred foot you need a written plan. Um, the you know specified resource sites, the largest protection on specified resource sites, three hundred feet you need a written plan. So we have this legislatively, you know, statutory reason to do a written plan that is bigger than the protection area on the wetlands. Now, that you may have a concern, and, and what the concerns I'm hearing is, um, is our wetland delineation process done at the appropriate time in terms of correctly delineating the actual riparian area. Mm -hmm. It's not done based on, I'm sorry, right, delineating the actual wetland area. It's not done solely on presence of water. It's done on uh, presence, my understanding is it's done on present, presence of vegetation that indicates. Um, and, and, and it's a common. Yeah. The wetland delineation is a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. And so really, Perhaps the thing for the bike rack is how are wetlands delineated on the Forest Practices Act? That might really be the question, because the protection standards are changing, and the and the administrative the administrative concept here is about how we manage uh, information relative to resources that require protection. And now a lot of those have been delineated or included in our in their, special resource. Uh, there we have a we ha uh, so in practice how you you know how you how you identify those resources on the ground that require protection is is a uh, there's a bunch of tools you do use to do that not the least of which is a, a Corps of Engineers uh, GIS layer where you start but you know practice has shown that's not the end of all things and it's like slope on a hill and a map or a weather map or what the anything that tells you about something that you're not standing there looking at is it's a good idea to go maybe look a little closer. We have examples of these. Um, and then the whole business of wetland, what happens, you know, that's probably for another day. You know, this is just about, do you need a written plan if you're within 200 oh, feet? Yeah. Of, before, yeah. before we go on, um, that help okay, that's why I want to know that what we're talking about is not any change in protection level. We're talking about whether we're going to require a written plan within that 100 to 200. The other thing we were trying to do is it was odd to have all of our riparian stuff at 100 feet and then one riparian thing at 300 feet. And that was causing a lot of administrative confusion in the in the field with people when they yeah. when you know, just the same kind of confusion that just what we're having right here. Room. And then, and the and the specified resource sites are in statute, and the streams are in rule. By the way, mm -hmm. so 
And, and one of the things is if you look at the Forest Practices Act, you know, the things that are in statute, that's what the legislature said. And the things that are in rule, that's what the people that do the business on the ground identified as a way to carry out the will of the legislature. Hey, now, I'm going to go out on a limb and talk about stuff that I don't know enough about to be 100% correct. But, you know, all, you've seen all this non-estuary written, non-estuary wetlands. Estuaries have much greater protection than significant wetlands. And so they're excluded. They, I believe they have a 300-foot riparian area because they're real different. And there's this the tidal influence zone and stuff. So they're, they're not included in any of this discussion. So just to kind of re reinforce that we're not talking about change in protection standards. And in some ways, you know, the exclusion of estuaries from this process is consistent with the exclusion of aerial applications of chemicals from this process. And that's because it's a more complex thing. How much more do you have? How are we doing, actually? Um, I have a couple more slides, and then really the, um, it was just, I have a, a slide that was going to be to spur some questions, but I think we're doing really well. <laughs> yeah, well, and, uh, and, and let's, so let's try to right? get through the slides. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, well, I'm asking okay. a process check if this is okay for folks. Is let's go ahead and just let Ashley finish. And we'll, and my, me in particular, give me mouth shut. Um, the, uh, and then we'll put our questions up, and then we'll take a break, and we can uh, stretch, get lunch, and then we can come back. And if there's some additional questions or discussion to follow up with Ashley, we would return to that. Does that work for everybody? Sure. Sounds great. Okay. Um, so just specifically about the general vegetation retention prescription. Um, been recommended to still require those written plans, and that's because they are higher complex operations uh, requiring some, some more knowledge, um, like the basal area account. And that's information that can't um, that does need to be that can't be conveyed through notification. And so it is being conveyed through written plan. And at this time, um, it just seems like the right thing to do is to keep that written plan. So that is being considered a value added. Um, so written plan summary, so we have value-added written plans and non-value-added plans. Value-added written plans are plans that are adding something more than just what the notification is bringing itself. So those, um, this, this is pretty conservative, it's cut and dry, but um, it's the written plans associated with general vegetation retention prescriptions. Um, I didn't put in, like we had talked about, aerial sprays or road construction, so we just felt that those weren't even going to be on the table right now, that, that we have the authority, the authority was given with those general vegetation retention prescriptions. So right now, though, we're still saying that those are value-added written plans. Uh, the non-value-added written plans are those written plans that were stating that they will not be directly affecting the RMA. So those written plans that were coming in, they were saying, we're not going to be working with the RMA. Paul says, OK, good, and then they get it back. And um, so that information, though, however, we feel can be communicated through the notification. So that um, essentially could be getting information quicker to everybody. So some of those uh, triggers that um, that storage foresters felt um, were things that required uh, that written plan were the general vegetation, road construction near waters, and that's associated with um, the culverts, um, cable yarding through RMAs, steep slopes, negative or no operator histories, so some of those new 